The hunt. You know the drill. Predator gets hungry. Predator hunts prey. Predator kills prey. Right? Wrong. Sometimes game plans fall apart and major screw-ups abound. But the hunter who pays attention to all the mishaps survives. Now, five ocean predators perform epic fails and reveal what it really takes to make the ultimate kill. Of all the fish in the sea, this is the top predator, the great white shark. A 5,000 pound male starts a hunt. He hasn't eaten for three days. He picks up a scent from two miles away. Seals. He's a great hunter, but he's not perfect. Great whites are unsuccessful more than half the time. Weather conditions, prey reactions, or just plain luck can tip the odds. But this guy's got some clear advantages. The most significant being lots of prey. Seal Island. It's early winter, right when this 75,000 course buffet must leave the island in search of food. It's the pup's first try at swimming. Instinctual grace soon surpasses clumsiness. They're on a mission. To get to their fishing grounds, they must run the gauntlet. The great white waits patiently. The older and wiser seals know what waits for them. The youngsters don't know any better. Hunger is a cruel taskmaster. There is safety in numbers. Lagging behind increases the chance of becoming a target. The littlest ones try to keep up. He can hear and feel them from over 200 meters away. In sharks, hearing and vibration detection are linked. The great white's invisible inner ears work together with two hollow tubes or lateral lines. Microscopic pores open them to the sea, and when something moves nearby, tiny hairs are stimulated, alerting him to the disturbance. Scientists call this sense a great white's distant touch. He can smell them, he can hear them, and by his distant touch, knows they're close. He just needs visual confirmation. He makes his move directly below his target. Then he stokes his engine. The tail is the shark's powerhouse. Red muscle sustains the swimming of the shark while white muscle allows for sudden bursts of speed, like a rocket booster, to launch upwards at speeds of up to 25 miles an hour. It's 
of fail. His elaborate sensory plan worked so well, he pinpointed a target and initiated the attack. The strike was textbook, except for a curve. Clear skies and calm seas, like today, worked to the prey's advantage. The seal saw him at the last minute. So when the shark made contact, his cover was already blown. The seal's whiskers detected tiny vibrations, so he was aware of the shark before he became dinner. The seals are now on high alert. The pups will head home in a few hours. By then, they'll be exhausted and easier targets. He slows his pace to save energy. The hunger pangs don't go away. By the afternoon, a wind ruffles the sea. The seals are full of fish, tired from hunting. It's supper time. He targets a young straggler. Younger seals are easier to hunt. Speed and agility come with experience. But he misses on the first breach. He doesn't give up this time. If you're a seal, never give a great white a straight line attack. Keep it turning and keep jumping. blind spots directly in front of the snout and right behind the head the seal luckily lands in those spots agility wins the seal makes it to the kelp double fail for the shark it came down to one critical moment the initial strike didn't bear fruit, and from then on, the odds were in favor of the seal. It became an agile torpedo, using its front flippers to propel itself away from the shark, while steering and changing direction with its back flippers. The Great White had already struck out once today, so when he missed the seal on the first strike, he should have just swum away. Two fails means he's lost out on over a million calories. The sun sets on a frustrating day's hunting, and the shark heads back into the deep. By morning, severe weather has blown in. His senses tell him the seals are already in the water, heading out to hunt. Perfect. A straggler. He drops into ambush position. The dark upper half of his body blends into the deep. He rockets upwards at 25 miles an hour. As he approaches impact, the ampullae of Lorenzini, the little sensors on the front of his snout, track the electrical charges of his target. He 
drives in for the kill, but something is wrong. Great White executes the perfect attack. But there's something wrong. Oh! It's a decoy seal set by a tourist boat to lure the shark. Great spectacle, but our shark didn't get his much needed dinner. It's an epic fail for the shark, but it's a valuable lesson on how sharks get it wrong. Most of his senses told him the target was real. He could smell seal. He could sense them in the water. His adapted eyeballs tracked the silhouette, and he hit the mark. It looked like a seal, acted like a seal, but it didn't taste like a seal. He was hoping for blubber, but instead, he got rubber. The more he tries, the more likely he is to make a kill, as long as he doesn't burn out. He needs to eat one seal pup every three days to keep up with the amount of energy he's burning. He needs a belly full of fatty seal now. Things are looking up. Overcast, choppy seas and murky water, perfect. No longer in tight formation, the seals are trickling in from their three-day fishing trip. He closes in on another target. It's a direct hit. Success at last. This time, the shark launched the strike just as the seal was taking a breath of air. In less than a second, the shark disabled the seal. His snout slammed down, hammering the upper jaw with almost 400 pounds of force. He can rip off 20 pounds of seal flesh in a second. His teeth are like saw blades, slicing off giant mouthfuls. For the Great White, all systems must be accurately aligned for the perfect hunt. Every seal he gets fuels his machine. The ones that get away motivate him to try again. If the Great White is the killing machine of the sea, this predator is its counterpart in the sky. Gannets are air-to-water missiles, plummeting at 60 miles an hour for their food. Now, they're leaving to track down a fishy feast. 200 miles away, millions of sardines start their annual migration. The sardines form one of many massive clouds of fish, called shoal, to follow blooms of plankton. It's time to fly or die. The sardines can travel up to 37 miles per day, but the gannets can cover 300 miles before refueling. Their bird's eye view means they can look for dark moving water, a sign of fish massing together. Unlike most birds, their eyes face forward, giving them binocular vision. They see them, or so they think. They were hunting for sardines, but instead, they've got a shoal of thousands of mackerel, bigger, more challenging fish to hunt. 
The shoal is at least 30 feet below the surface. The gannets prepare their superpower. They climb to almost 100 feet to maximize momentum and gravity. They have to be perfectly aligned or they will die on impact. Wings tuck, feet stow, then into an arrow shape. Most objects at this speed and from this height would hit the water like it's a brick wall, but the gannets cut right through it. Protective membranes cover the eyes and act as goggles during the dive. The beak is strong and pointed. Their nostrils are internal, preventing any water from entering on impact. The thick skull bone is a crash helmet, and air pockets inside are like airbags, cushioning the blow. The gannet's momentum drives it 30 feet below the surface. The mackerel bunch together, making it tough for the gannets to pinpoint one fish. There's strength in numbers. And then the ball descends deeper, away from the menace above. The gannet has two options, go back to the life of a bird or transform into the awesome super fish. The gannets won't give up. Instead, these birds turn into superfish. They flatten their wings and swim. They can reach 60 feet while holding their breath. They close in on the big ball of fish. The gannets grab hold of the mackerel. But their plan of attack isn't working. The mackerel are wriggling free. Despite serrations near the tip of the gannet's bill, good for gripping slippery fish. The shoal retreats to a hundred feet, deeper than a gannet can dive without running out of air. It's a fail. The high dive was perfectly executed. Within seconds, the fish were under siege. But when they grabbed the prey, the mackerel slipped free. Mucus covers their thin skin, making them hard to hold on to. The gannets are tired from the lengthy flight, and today the strong swimming mackerel proved too much for them. Then the entire shoal descended beyond gannet depth. With empty bellies, they take to the skies once more. This time, they'll go for smaller, easier to grip sardines. But where are they? The gannets are now more than a day's flight behind the sardines. They need to hustle, a huge challenge for the young flyers among them. Their time and energy are running out. While the gannets search above the water, a menace prepares for battle below. Super quick, phenomenally agile, and equipped with lethal weapons. It's the fastest fish in the ocean, the sailfish. The school has found the sardines and is closing in. 
When a single sardine joins a shoal, it gains protection in the crowd, but it also joins a big waving advertisement for food, which is why the shoal is also called a bait ball. This sailfish feels the water pressure vibrations of the shoal, and it knows it's big. Once it locates the sardines, it chases them down. An army of sailfish now arrive from all directions. The first step is to surround the sardines. Next, the hunters flare their sail-like dorsal fins to startle the sardines, and split them into smaller balls. Then, they cleverly herd the ball upward to the surface, limiting the prey's options of escape. They have the sardines right where they want them. But how does it track its target in this high-speed chase? Sailfish have specialized heater organs attached to the brain and eyes. The heaters circulate warm blood to help boost physical performance. And the high temperature of their eyes increases the resolution for forward and upwards vision. The eyes can then process the movement faster, crucial at these extreme speeds. As fast as a cheetah sprinting on land, they reach speeds of 70 miles an hour. The sickle-shaped tail powers the fish forward while the pelvic fins work like rudders to steer and stabilize. Time for the ultimate weapon, his super sharp bill. Its needle nose isn't for stabbing, it's mainly for slashing. The bill is so thin that the sailfish plunges it into the sardine shoal undetected. He whips his head to strike, and then the unbelievable happens. It's a sardine sailfish smackdown. The sailfish uses its bill to slash at the sardines and isolate a victim. The next sailfish in line takes aim and strikes. It's completely off. When one misses, another is ready to take its place. Another fail. Or is it? Sailfish don't just pick off individuals. They hit multiple sardines over and over again. As it slashes, the tip of the bill can cover 20 feet and turn through 575 degrees in a single second. That's a lot quicker than a sardine can swim and a lot faster than it can react. The more the sailfish strike, the more they injure and exhaust the sardines. Now, they're easy pickings.
Skewering may not be the intention, but it works. Victory. The sailfish were relentless in their attack. First, they teamed up and moved their targets into position. Then, they used their two-foot-long bills to wound the sardines and wear them down. This first attack took its toll. Each sardine was roughed up, then gulped down by the sailfish in less than a tenth of a second. Every sailfish ultimately got a meal. Sailfish are superb killers with specialized strategies, but it's the orca that takes the prize for the craziest hunter in the sea. No other animal risks its life to get a meal with such an outrageous stunt. It's January along the Argentine coast, and the sea lions have come ashore to have pups. Sea lions are agile, but on land, they're clumsy and awkward. The pup's kindergarten beach seems secure, but the sea is the hunter's hideout. The young seals take their first swimming lesson in the shallows. As they splash in the water, they give their exact position away to the finely tuned sonar receptors of the orcas. Sound waves travel through water four and a half times faster than through air. The orca emits a series of clicks through its forehead like a beam. When the sound hits an object, it bounces back as an echo. This echo location gives a detailed picture of the size, shape, speed, distance, and direction of the prey. The orca has no problem finding her target. It's getting to it in the shallows that's nearly impossible. At seven and a half tons, she risks beaching herself. She must wait for high tide. Four hours later, the tide is up, but it's still too shallow in places. She searches for a spot where the high tide will help push her right up to the beach. She's found one. She gears up to perform a super stunt, totally unique to this pod. Speed is everything. The pups have no idea what's coming. The female orca prepares to ambush her target. Surfing away, she speeds toward the beach at 30 miles an hour. It's a fail. Success is determined by forward planning and critical timing. She didn't get enough speed at launch. Then, at the last minute, she ran out of water to surf and put on the brakes. This gave her away, and the pups escaped. It's a skill that takes years to get right. She tries over and over.
In this pod, there are a lot of mouths to feed, and the orcas need to eat at least three seal pups every day. Without warning, another orca launches a shore hunt. He's got a reputation as the expert hunter in the pod. His technique is to catch a wave and surf to the seal. He's got it. But now, he's also stuck. And yet he doesn't let go of the pup. He'll die if he doesn't get back into deeper water. How can this massive 22,000 pound mammal haul its own bulk out of this fix? He starts thrashing. It looks like panic. But it's not panic. He's turning around. He's free. It's all about precision and timing. He caught the force of the wave, which delivered him right to the sea. His power and bulk created enough momentum to throw him high up the beach. His expert breaching turned into a temporary beaching. But he got out of it with a technique he's been perfecting for years. The wiggle, all with the seal still trapped in his mouth. But instead of chowing down, this killer decides to play with his food. The youngster joins in on the game of seal tossing. Scientists believe this could be hunting training for the calves. Practice means fewer failed hunts. The hunting season is short. Before long, the pups learn to stay clear of the water, and the orcas become less and less successful. It's time for this pod to move on. But another, much bigger pod is just getting started. It begins with a family of 12. They find others with the same goal. The families don't compete, but join forces form ranks, and are soon a legion of 1,000 strong. A ready-to-hunt megapod. They've got 300 miles to cover to reach their target off the coast of South Africa. What drives this obsessive journey? None other than the irresistible sardine, now migrating within their reach. And they are being watched closely from above. Having failed to find the sardines themselves, the gannets place their bets on the dolphins. Just follow and let them do the hard work. Like their giant dolphin cousins, the orcas, they use their sonar to communicate, navigate, and home in on their prey with deadly accuracy. Thousands of echo-locating predators soon pick up the swimming fish. The sardine migration pushes steadily northwards. This shoal is an astonishing nine miles long, two miles wide, and up to 130 feet deep. In some places, the shoal is so dense and moving so fast that the fish in the middle die from a lack of oxygen. More than half a billion fish are swimming towards the dolphins. It's impossible for a shoal this big to hide 
from the Megapod's detection system. The sardines fall right into the dolphin's trap. Now, the hard work begins. Holding their breath for up to 10 minutes, they work to split the shoal and push a smaller group towards the surface. They do it, herding the fish like border collies corralling sheep. Under attack from all angles, the sardines stick together. But a tiny sardine should never be underestimated. Along with vision, they coordinate their movements by reacting to water flow. When it works, they avoid bumping into each other. Organs, called neuromasts, line the skin around the sardine's head and accurately detect motion between themselves and the surrounding water. As one fish moves, it creates a flow of water that provides information to the fish next to it or behind it, allowing them to keep their place within the rapidly moving shoal. This is how a shoal works. Thousands can move as one. Each individual tries to find safety in the middle, creating a mass continuously folding in on itself. Nobody wants to be stuck on the outside. The gannets flock overhead, waiting for the fish to come within reach. The alliance is about to reach its climax. The table is set, everyone is in position. But unexpected diners show up. Sharks. Thousands of them. Thousands of sharks are ruining the picnic. The dolphins and gannets hold back. Feeding with the enemy means they could easily become a meal themselves. The sharks think they can collect the proceeds from the dolphins' hard work. They bully their way in. Destroy the tidy formations the dolphins have organized. But the sharks can't get a mouthful. The dolphins regroup. Just maybe they can patch up the mess. Sharks are worked up, but they're not denying access to the sardines. The dolphins boldly focus on turning this setback into a victory. If they don't, they all go hungry. Dolphin, gannet, even shark. The dolphins are back to hurting. The sardines respond as predicted, defensively moving into a tight ball close to the surface. The gannets watch the turmoil from above. They're done with waiting. Hunger drives them to take the risk and feed with the sharks. The feast fast becomes a frenzy. for the dolphin's final weapon, a net of bubbles. The bubbles form a barrier that the sardines don't like to cross. With no escape, the shoal is shrinking fast. Shark, bird, and dolphin all get a piece of the action. 
until a newcomer completely changes the game again. It appears out of nowhere like a high-speed train. Forty-two feet in length, with the ability to swallow a small car, the Brutus whale vacuums up hundreds of sardines in one mouthful. He makes the shark look like a minnow. Flicks of its muscular tail power it upwards at high speeds. Even with its gigantic ballooning mouth creating drag. Another whale explodes out of the depths. This time, it's a female. She's even bigger than the male. And she needs to eat over 3,000 sardines a day to survive. Whales triumphed in what the sharks initially attempted, a latecomer cleanup job. The dolphins scoop up what's left, and there's not much. Only one lucky sardine survives. It sees a gap, hightails it out of there. It was a surprising, multi-staged, multi-species kill with critical turning points. The dolphins were the masterminds, tracking the shoal with sonar. The gannets used them to locate the migration. The dolphins triggered chaos. Sardines retreated into a ball. The final step was to split the shoal into smaller balls and chase them up to the surface. Then the sharks bulldozed their way in. Messing with the dolphins' plan, and not helping their own cause. But the dolphins had the courage to regroup and pack the fish together again. As a result, all the predators could gorge themselves until the dark horse showed up. He vacuumed as much as he could before the bigger female took over, and she finished them off before the others could. Still, the super pod of dolphins is well fed. They disband and go their separate ways. The gannets now have enough protein to fly home. The sharks are full. And the whale did the least amount of work for the most reward. The sardines were massacred. There is safety in numbers, to a point. But predators catch on and triumph, especially when they work together for their bounty. As they will again every year, exquisitely timing their hunt to the Great Migration.